how very charitable of you to listen to my recitation upon the subject of the manifestation of my imagination that can be best articulated as an authorial avatar in a popular interpersonally driven tabletop gaming narrative featuring the copious application of polyhedrons utilized to generate pseudo-random numbers for the sake of a facsimile of unpredictability. I am profoundly titillated by the blatant demonstration that my erstwhile companions are worthy of a perjurative epithet first coined by Dr. Seuss to delightfully underscore the implicit social ineptitude and unhealthy fixations with entertainment venues outside the commonly accepted cultural norms. The aforementioned avatar is a composite aggregation of my most highly esteemed characteristics and traits from a show assist sampling of animated referential materials originating in the island land masses of glorious Nippon. Though it is to my understanding that I do not provide much in the way of useful categorization with such a broad statement, and for this I am most apologetic. Despite the characteristic amusement many a listener would expect of me, I must sheepishly protest that the aforementioned perjurative, while irrefutably applicable to myself and each of us, is not as lamentably severe as such statements would infer. The character owns and typically chooses to adorn himself with a coat in the referential style of that which was adapted in the trenches of the First World War. It of course can be inferred that this statement does not apply during inappropriate times such as sleeping, bathing, and formal occasions in requirement of more suitable attire. The primary vestment is of a striking vermilion hue that particularly stimulates visual receptors of the eyes in opposition to stimulus of the green receptors by virtue of reflecting visible light in the spectrum of approximately 700 nanometers. He is also in possession of a firearm that he is most reticent in the application of, utilizing its primary function as a ballistic projectile source exclusively for the sake of inflicting bodily injury and irreparable structural damage to immobile and living structures that can be found in the surroundings. The rationale behind such an implausible application of a handheld firearm is simply due to the owner's profound lack of faith in the practice of utilizing force to such consequence that a life is mournfully extinguished. The moniker by which this oft referred simulacrum answers to is Sephiroth Chester Filch Fest Airwick Penis Withington Goku. I must correct your meritorious yet incomplete contribution, as it seems you have made an error of omission, and to continue with our camera artery laden banter without addressing this error for the sake of revision would be a gross mistake. His name is properly rendered and referable as Sephiroth Chester Filch Fest Airwick Potter's Field Penis Withington Kendrick Brickinridge Field and Orthro Quincy Futh Crawford Wright Gilbert Goku the Stampede. As this full address is distressingly inconvenient, it will be vastly more prudent to address the narrative proxy as Sephiroth Goku the Stampede. Pardon my excitement, it is to say in addition, in which so forth that circumstances collided in a variety of quite shocking ways. He was formerly among the considerations of the heavenly host as an angel of unspecified choir, rank, or utility. Subsequently, he was also a devil, and it is woefully unclear to me to which of many varied meanings we are to interpret this fiendish appellation. Regardless, at the rough point in time in which the synthesized estate of the character was simultaneously angel and devil, he forsook his birthrights and natural callings. The reason for such a drastic shift in identity was because of, the romantics and narrative patterns of similar story archetypes may have already speculated, the discovery of profound feelings of affection for another. Please, comrades. Permit me to continue my enthusiastic monologue featuring the aforementioned character. I implore you to broaden your metaphorical vision. Our colleague who evidently chose to adopt a pseudonym stemming from the Latin origin of iron in particular should keep his sight strictly in narrative, lest yet another beverage saturate one of his corneas. As established, 
The character in question was previously an eclectic contradiction of simultaneous infernal and divine majesty, yet rejected his high birthrights for the sake of a female contemporary. Haminit was remarkable most primarily in her straightforward demeanor, and yet faithfully adored Sephiroth Ku with every cardiac fiber in her. Haminit was remarkable most primarily in her straightforward demeanor, and yet faithfully adored Sephiroth Goku with every cardiac fiber in her chest cavity along with significant portions of her aorta. I will suggest that the girl was in fact afflicted with vampirism, a condition speculated to be historically mistaken in place of porphyric hemophilia, to considerable tragedy to the afflicted and yet rich, if contemporarily questionable, in contributions to literature and culture as a whole. I must interject that this is however not the case. Though your suggestion has vast comedic merit, the female was not afflicted with vampirism, because our primary subject matter, Sephiroth Goku, was bitten by a vampire himself and immediately subjected to a tragic bloodthirst in which he subsequently exsanguinated his object of romantic affection. Suffice to say that his mood since the incident has been grossly pessimistic and plagued by extensive periods of introspection. A hobby of his for many years was to position himself on rooftops, ostensibly intruding upon private premises by doing so most typically during periods of significant li <laughs> significant liquid precipitation. His resemblance to a gargoyle is unquestionable in such periods, however actually categorizing Sephiroth Goku as a gargoyle would be a mistake as he is more accurately a vampirized scholar of esoteric mysticism originating as an angel demon. Recognizing the common narrative archetypes at hand, I cannot help but speculate that the lost love was of exceptional moral fiber and down-to-earth upbringing, embodying classical virtues of what is most often viewed as ethically correct with a simultaneous determination to achieve apotheosis and reach the zenith of any subject matter to which she applied herself. This in addition to her status as being enrolled in academia. I concur with your hypothetical assessment for she uncannily resembled a girl less than one half of a score in age, yet endowed with equally uncanny intellect far surpassing the expected norms of any comparable classification bracket. For this reason her academic progress was accelerated to approximately the 11th grade. With the nature of Sephiroth Goku's former romantic object of interest thoroughly defined in concrete terms thus addressed, I can now proceed to the matters of events following the tragedy that incurred the cessation of her continued living. He obtained an automaton of considerable stature by miraculously locating it beneath stratified mineral substrates in irregular condensation. The automaton greeted him with, and I am forced to paraphrase of course, my identification is that of a large mechanical facsimile of natural life, yet I'm not myself alive. However this inconsequential matter does not obstruct me from expressing my sincere confidence in your personal merits. This was swiftly appended with an assertion of camaraderie, to which Sephiroth Goku affirmed his determination to avenge his lady counterpart. However, the opposition he explicitly took stance against was of tremendous foulness and lack of objective or subjective merit in the development of a positive future thus regarded as of great evil, possessing both undeniable skill in arcane practices that were doubtless put to frequent use in the mistreatment of others as well as majority ownership of a corporate behemoth backed by extensive capital, no less. I propose an inquiry into the status of the evil vampire wizard's skeletal and muscular fitness and overall physique. Our assigned antagonist was in possession of seven. I repeat my inquiry and demand a prompt reply delivered post haste, to which I would be inclined to reply that the primary antagonist of the yarn ice pin is indeed possessed of pinnacle athleticism, and could colloquially be referred to as buff. Continuing on, the antagonist is the prime administrator and executive of a corporate body, though is accompanied by a board of director staff that are all vampires themselves, presumably sired by the primary and subsequently installed in positions of authority via cronyism. As the corporate conglomerate is assaulted by our hero Sephiroth Goku, 
They are prepared to retaliate and defend themselves via the utilization of combat-worthy automata of their own constructed out of the headquarter offices of each business thus represented. However, their assembly also incorporates genetic replicas of the deceased matrons from previous vampiric broods. Utilizing the temporal relocation utilities at their disposal, our hero is transported to the era of previous events. This unsettling change of circumstances is made fortuitous when Sephiroth Goku encounters his prior self still possessed of nebulously angelic fiendish prowess. They bond easily, of course, as they are the same person merely at different points in life and thus of abundant measures in common. The contemporary Sephiroth Goku encourages his past self to improve upon the outcomes of much dreaded events ominously impending, though articulates himself poorly in his excitement. This circumstance is swiftly interrupted by the jarring encounter of Sephiroth Goku's deceased lady's past self, still living in the past as the events leading to her termination of living have yet to transpire. Our protagonist thankfully resists the temptation to relive happy times and focuses on the conflict at hand, loudly exclaiming a war cry presumably to motivate himself and psychologically impact his adverses, enthusiastically joined by his past self. At this point in the story there is a gratuity of violent behaviors not normally permitted in civilized circles yet rendered acceptable by necessities of circumstance. The city environment in which the conflict occurs is thankfully safeguarded by mechanisms that winch the entire urban region underground. This system was implemented precisely for situations like this. A scarcely controlled detonations are counterproductive to the continued functional well-being of a city. As explosions occur with alarming yet intentional frequency, Sephiroth Goku recounts to his opposition's past selves that he is not his as a then contemporary self, actually transferred unwillingly from the future by their own future selves in a fit of circumstantial irony. Appalled by this, the board of vampiric directors exclaims stupefied disbelief before having their potential energy violently converted into non-directional thermal energy, light, sound, and shrapnel due to the superiority of Sephiroth Goku's combat automaton. I would postulate a query unto you regarding the situation, requesting clarification as to the conversion process in geometric dimensions. It would be a preposterous size though mathematically perfect and with all points upon its outermost boundary equidistant from the center, additionally lacking a concussive rapid displacement of air, though this is a matter of which I assure you not to trouble yourself with. At this juncture, Sephiroth Goku proudly proclaims his triumph, only to be caught unawares by the abrupt appearance of the primary antagonist, the head vampire demon Zeobuff wizard who pierces the protective plating of the automaton in order to impale our battle-weary anti-heroic figure through the cardiac region of his torso. In yet another moment of satisfying irony, Sephiroth Goku is immune to this otherwise fatal surprise maneuver due to the fact he is himself a vampire and thus lacks a functioning heart. In addition to the prior physiological differences afforded to a heavenly fiend hybrid from the previous events of future timelines. Millennia in the past. Our protagonist is nevertheless concerned, as his adversary pridefully explicates full intentions to put an end to their ungentlemanly dispute post haste. Upon which Sephiroth Goku reveals his trump card at this moment bellowing at uncomfortably high volumes that he possesses a roguish and unexpected advantage. His automaton then rearranges its corporeal structures into what is admittedly yet majestically a trivially different configuration. In theatric recounting of these events, brass instrumentation would very likely accompany this climactic point. Our hero, having confronted and successfully accepted his flaws of character that had previously rendered him an anti-hero. In the midst of Sephiroth Goku's posturing, the evil CEO vampire buff wizard is stunned into frozen shock, loudly expressing his disbelief with a throaty. How could this be? As our tale proceeds to its final events, I assure you that Sephiroth Goku then issues forth a coherent stream of photons from his upper torso, likely between the pectoral muscles or approximately the sternum. This caused by the hero's faith in his own fortitude of character. The photon stream subsumes the vampire, 
as it is after all the same force all vampires dreading concentrate. However, the activation of this final weapon jump starts the temporal device once more and catapults Sephiroth Goku alone to the precise minute of when he was attacked in the past by the vampire. This enables him to prevent the very event that sent his life and love spiraling into cataclysmic disrepair and as such he is able to return to his own proper time with his previously deceased lover restored. He elocutes to his reunited fairer half the events in briefest summation and happily proceeds with her to a social gathering of prepared comestibles in cordiality. And good. Fatality Agent said, that's a pretty good show. What do you call that act? <laughs> the Aristocrats. <laughs> <laughs>